good morning. It's good to see everyone today. We are going to have a few announcements here as we begin, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then Stephen will come and open us up by leading us in a couple of songs this morning. Uh, but before we uh, get too far, I do want to take care of a few of announcements. Some of these may pertain to a few of you. I don't think uh, so. If they do pertain to you, just make sure that you are aware of these announcements. I think they're also in the uh, electronic prayer bulletin that gets passed around every week. Uh, there is an offering plate for those who give out on the back for your area. Uh, make sure that you drop your offering in there. A couple of events coming up at the end of the month, August the 27th, is going to be the next men's prayer breakfast, 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, men, if you are interested in taking part and signing up for that, uh, there is a sign-up sheet. If you could put your name on the sign-up sheet as quickly as possible um, so that uh, we will have a, an idea as to how many people uh, to plan for that. That, again, is August the 27th. September the 7th is the beginning of our Fall Clubs program. And uh, that is uh, just a little, about a month away or so. It's Wednesday night. And uh, so I do have a couple of announcements concerning the fall program coming up. If you are part of the fall program, you might want to get a pen and write some of these things out. Uh, first of all, we are going to have a quick meeting tonight after the evening service. Uh, there are a few that have some questions about their role and all of that. And so we want to make sure that everybody uh, understands what their, uh, what their uh, role in the fall program is going to be. So tonight after the evening service, if you can plan to stay for a couple of minutes... Uh, that would be wonderful. There will be a follow-up meeting August the 27th. That's Wednesday night. That's coming up in about a week, I think, next, maybe next Wednesday. And uh, there'll be another meeting during the Wednesday night prayer time. And then the 31st is going to be a bit of a dress rehearsal. It's just going to give an, everyone an opportunity uh, to go through the program each week and to understand how um, all the classes are going to function together and where they're uh, just beg, just kind of a dress rehearsal. So that'll be the week before uh, September the 7th, and then September the 7th, the program begins. Uh, we've been discussing what to call it. Uh, we've been calling it uh, Fall P Kids Program, and a couple other names, I think, have been thrown around. So we are uh, in the process right now of picking a name for the kids program coming up in the fall. Um, it began last week, this Sunday morning, at the end of the service, if you have a name that you would like to throw into the pot, you can put it in the offering plate. All names need to be in the offering plate by the end of this morning, and uh, tonight I am going to pass around a piece of paper uh, that has all of the names that have been contributed. So if you have uh, one that you would like to throw in the pot, uh, write it down, actually I guess throw in the plate, write it down, put it in the offering plate. Um, next Sunday, we're going to, in the evening service, we're going to take that list and we're going to vote on the three finalists. We're going to whittle it down to three names. And then the final week, August the 28th, we'll have the final vote. And if your name is chosen to be the name for our fall kids program, there will be a prize. Uh, so a little incentive. Make sure that you have that name in, by the, uh, in the offering plate by the end of the service today. At that time, there will be no more names allowed to be given because I have to be able to, to put it down as to all of the names that are given and so everyone knows what names to pick from for next week. Anyways, that is going to be how we choose the club's name. Make sure you get that in the offering plate uh, by the end of the morning service. And then coming up September the 18th is our quarterly business meeting, uh, though that'll be after the morning service. We generally are done within about 15 minutes, so members, if you can plan uh, to stay uh, around after the, the morning service on September the 18th. We'll, uh, we'll have that meeting and then hopefully it won't take long. And I think that's it for our announcements today. So at this time we'll have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our meeting this morning, our service this morning, and then Stephen will come up and lead us in a couple of songs as we begin. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you love us enough to send your son uh, to die on the cross that we could be saved. Lord, as we uh, take a few moments to open up your word and to and to study uh, John's account of the crucifixion today. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, for those of us who have trusted you as your Savior, that we would be drawn closer to you by remembering what you did in our place. Lord, the wrath of God that you endured and that, that you uh, placed upon your own shoulders because we were sinful and we were separated from you. And Lord, we're so thankful uh, for the love that you showed us and uh, Lord, the grace that you bestowed uh, to each one of us through your crucifixion. 
Lord, if there is any here today that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, may they realize that they stand condemned before, before an almighty God. Lord, may they realize that there is nothing that they can do personally of their own efforts to ever uh, warrant salvation. There's nothing they can do to earn it. It is simply a gift that must be received. And Lord, may they realize today what you did on their behalf. Lord, may they understand and recognize today, Lord, that the only way to have eternal life is by accepting the gift that Jesus Christ offered. And may they do that today. Lord, as we have an opportunity to sing songs about the cross, may we worship you and may we give you the glory and the honor that you deserve. Lord, may you be pleased today with all that we say and do. May you be pleased today with our songs. And Lord, may we walk away today, uh, Lord, closer to you than when we came in with a greater appreciation for all that you've done for us. Lord, and a new desire to serve you and to be obedient to you and to be a testimony for you uh, because of what you have done for us. Lord, we pray these things in your name today. We pray these things. Amen. Stephen, go ahead and come forward as we get ready to sing this morning. We'll start with song 258. There is a fountain filled with blood, 258. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing this morning. <clears throat>
I was telling Pastor this morning how wonderful it is to be able to do this because it, uh, it's really fun, I guess you would say, to, uh, to study some of these psalms and to discover the meaning and the context of them. So today we have Psalm 22. So if you want to open your Bibles there, we can follow along as I read. Psalm 22, to the chief musicians set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. This psalm is, encompasses the sufferings of the Messiah. Even though the psalm is written by David, um, David uh, becomes prof prophetic in this psalm. David sings as more than an artist, but as one of the greatest prophets ever to speak because of this psalm. David sings more of Jesus and the Messiah's suffering than his own. We can see from the first line of this psalm that even though things in the psalm are certainly true of King David's life, it is even truer of Jesus the Messiah than of David. Jesus deliberately chose the words we find in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ in his last hours, while being tortured, rejected, abandoned, forsaken, and despised, may have well been meditating on this psalm and saw his crucifixion as a fulfillment of this psalm. On that day, a holy transaction took place. God the Father regarded his son as if he were a sinner. As the Apostle Paul would later write, God made him who knew no sin for us, or no sin to be sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus not only endured the withdrawal of the Father's fellowship, but the actual outpouring of the Father's wrath as our substitute for our sinful humanity. So let's read Psalm 22 together, thinking that as Jesus was being persecuted and hung on a cross, he reflected on this psalm. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb you made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, and strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me out of the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all of you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abandoned the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pray, I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember it and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him. Even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. 
it will recount of the Lord, it will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. That he has done this. It's remarkable how David penned these words for himself, but also a, as a prophetic message. In verse 14, he says, my bones are out of joint. And in verse 16, he says, they pierce my hands and my feet. David did not know the practice of crucifixion in his day, but he described the physical agony of it with the accuracy of the prophet of the Lord. In the latter verses, we see God answers the forsaken, <clears throat> forsaken with the fulfillment of these words, you have answered me. It is impossible to say with certainty, was it while he hung on the cross? after the glorious transaction of being the sin of mankind, or perhaps it was after the triumphant announcement, it is finished, or before the words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We can't be certain, but a reestablished fellowship replaced the sense of forsakenness for the Christ. And the psalm that begins with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, ends with that he, God, has done this. This sounds very familiar with the Lord's cry, It is finished. Take your hymnals once again and turn to hymn 230. Hymn 230 will sing glory to his name. songs. One more is in the hymn book. If you turn to 237, just a few pages over, 237 at the cross. And then we'll have our next one out of the supplement before the message this morning. Uh,
should be a folder in your hymn book rack, and it's the power of the cross, and it would be toward a couple pages back from the back of the book, uh, is where that is. So we'll go ahead and sing all four verses before the message. this time, Junior Church is dismissed to your class downstairs, and uh, we'll be in John today, John chapter 19, as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. We're getting close to the end now. I know it's been a while, a uh, long time since we started. I think as I was looking back at my various notes over this Gospel, I think this is the longest series that I've preached so far. Uh, and, uh, but I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I know you might be wondering, we haven't had a song of the month this month. Uh, maybe it's something for you to pray about. One of the ministries that the Doles did, uh, but those folders that you see in front of your pews and the ones we just sang from, they're the ones each month that put all that together for us. And, uh, and I appreciated that. They didn't ever want anybody to know, although I think probably some of us here already knew that. And, uh, but I appreciated that ministry that they did, and, uh, and if you would like to maybe consider that, let me know, making that your ministry, uh, let me know, and uh, we can continue doing that. It's one of the things that I don't have time to do in my schedule each week. I appreciated the fact that they did that for us. Um, 
We're going to be in John chapter 19 today as we continue, as I mentioned just a moment ago, our study through. Today's message is uh, the crucifixion of the Savior of the world. And I know if you're like me, the last, oh, probably month to five or six messages as we have looked at uh, really the last evening that the Lord shared with His disciples, that, uh, that last supper, the Garden of Gethsemane and the discourse there as we looked and as we considered uh, the trial and the beating that he took last week, and then the crucifixion uh, that we're going to look at this morning. I know all of that uh, kind of weighs heavy, doesn't it? And uh, it's one of those uh, messages, it's one of the, one of the I, not just messages, but series of messages that, that is, it's, uh, it's really hard to preach, it's hard to, to, um, to study and uh, to consider, and the reason is, I believe, because it's not just a story that we read about somebody who endured a great uh, amount of persecution uh, for the good that they did. It, it, it's not just a story that we read. It's a real account uh, of Jesus, our Savior, who endured so much, not because of what he did, but because of what we did. And I know that it's been a dark, heavy cloud the last month and a half or so, going through the Gospel of John. But we know that next week's message is going to be a little different, isn't it? Because next week we get to study about the resurrection and how he rose from the grave and gave us the hope of eternal life. But we can't get to the resurrection we can't get to the hope of eternal life without first studying what he endured on our behalf. So that's where we are today. I'll try to keep it together. I know last week it was difficult going through the beating that he endured. Um, we'll try to keep it together today and, uh, and get through the sermon as we look at the crucifixion of the Savior of the world. We'll be in John chapter 19 looking at verses 17 up to the end of the chapter, verse number 42, and we're going to see really five aspects or characteristics of Christ's crucifixion this morning. And we're going to work through them fairly quickly. I don't want to belabor the point. In fact, as we read through his crucifixion in the Gospel of John, I think you might be interested, as I was interested, to realize really how little John says about the crucifixion itself. He doesn't go into great detail. There's not a lot that is said. In fact, really, the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, give us far more detail than John does. But we do find five aspects of, of the crucifixion that John gives in the gospel. The first aspect of this crucifixion, we see that Jesus' crucifixion is public. Jesus' crucifixion is public, and we see this as we begin in verses 17 and 18 of John chapter 19. First, he is paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. And remember that this is the, the time of Passover. Jerusalem is at its fullest at this point. There are more people in Jerusalem at this time of year than probably any other time of year. And it is at this time that Jesus is paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. Look at verse number 17 with me. It says here, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, according to Roman custom, the condemned was, was, uh, the condemned was to carry his cross from the place of his sentencing to the place of crucifixion, which was called the place of the skull. Now, this place, um, where, where exactly it is in Jerusalem uh, today, there's a couple of different thoughts as to where this place of crucifixion was. But nonetheless, we, we understand that he was paraded through the streets to the place that is called Golgotha, the place of a skull. The condemned was forced to carry not only his cross throughout the, the, the city in public shame, but was also, uh, was also supposed to carry around his neck a placard that was to tell everybody what he was condemned to die for. He was to carry his cross, although it was normally just the cross piece and not the entire cross that he was condemned to carry throughout the streets. We see, first of all, that he was paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. Second of all, we see in verse number 18, he is crucified to a cross. 
Notice verse number 18. It says, where they crucified him. The Persians invented crucifixion, but it was the Romans who perfected it. It was the form of execution reserved for the worst criminals and the lowest social classes. Crucifixion was designed to make the victim die publicly, slowly, and with great pain and humiliation. In fact, crucifixion was so awful and degrading that people would not talk about it publicly. Listen to what Cicero, a Roman statesman, says of crucifixion. He says, it is a crime to bind a Roman citizen, to scourge him is an act of wickedness, to execute him is almost murder. What shall I say of crucifying him? An act so abominable, it is impossible to find any word adequately to express it, he says. The Roman historian Tacitus called crucifixion a torture fit only for slaves. It was a humiliating, degrading, painful death. In fact, the gospel writers do not give a detailed description of the crucifixion, even though several Old Testament authors describe crucifixion years before it was a common form of execution. I think there are several reasons why the gospel writers do not talk a great deal about the actual description of the crucifixion. First of all, their original readers were very familiar with crucifixion. They saw it quite frequently in Jerusalem and in Rome. So they needed no explanation as to, as to its cruelty and its brutality. They understood how cruel and brutal crucifixions were. Secondly, the gospel writers take care to not use language or description that could sway emotions, but they simply share the account. And then the third reason why I believe is because the greater suffering of Jesus was not the physical beating that he bore. It was not the physical persecution that he endured. The greater suffering of Jesus was the inward and the spiritual as he bore the entire wrath of God in our place. I thank Wayne for preaching my message already this morning uh, earlier when he read the scripture and reminded us it was the wrath of God that Jesus endured in our place. Yes, the crucifixion was brutal. It was terrible. It was humiliating. But what made Jesus' death on the cross so much different than anybody else who had ever endured a crucifixion and died on a cross was that he hung there in our place. It wasn't just the physical that he endured. It was the spiritual, it was the entire wrath of God as he bore that and as, he, and as the God the Father turned his back on his only begotten Son because of the sin that we committed. It was spiritual. Finally, as we look at this public crucifixion, we see uh, his company. Jesus was not alone in his public execution. As we continue in verse number 18, it says, And two others with him, one on either side. Three men were crucified that day on Calvary. Two of them were thieves. And Jesus was in the center, it says. The the synoptic gospels give further details concerning the other two thieves. In fact, Matthew and Mark use the word lestos or brigand or thief, which is the same word used to describe Barabbas earlier in the passage. Given that Jesus was being crucified in the place of Barabbas, if you remember, Pilate gave him the choice of Barabbas, who was supposed to be crucified that day, or Jesus, and they chose Barabbas to be set free. So, as we see that Jesus was to be, uh, as we see that Jesus was to be crucified in the place of Barabbas, it is possible that these three thieves were all associated with one another. In any case, Jesus was placed in the center cross. This was literally true. Yet consider, in a symbolic sense, how else Jesus was placed in the center that day. First of all, Jesus was centered among humanity. Jesus never distanced himself from the average people. He freely interacted with those thought to be great men. From his incarnation through his whole life, he lived as one of us. Jesus died among men and women, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, high class and no class. He died among the educated and the uneducated, the religious and the secular, the guilty and the innocent, those who hated him and those who loved him. Jesus was centered among humanity. Jesus was centered among sinful men. He spent his life with sinful men. He never sought to separate himself from them. He ate with them. He talked with them. He lived among them. In the end, he died with them. 
The self-righteous of the day thought that it, was, it, would be, it would be troubling to him more to die with the lowest of society, and yet Jesus was centered among sinners to the very end. Thirdly, Jesus was centered between believing individuals and rejecting individuals. Matthew chapter 27, 44 tells us that both thieves mocked Jesus in the beginning, but Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 41, describes the conversation of the one. The last person that Jesus personally ministered was a criminal converted on a cross just before his final breath. Jesus brought him into salvation. Lastly, Jesus was centered between righteous God and wicked men. Jesus on the cross took all the punishment for our sin. With no hope for mankind of ever standing before a righteous God, Jesus was offered up to bear the punishment of our sin at the cross. Jesus was both the priest and the sacrifice. He was centered between righteous God and wicked men. We see secondly this morning as we continue through chapter 19, Jesus' crucifixion was political. It was a political crucifixion. It was Roman custom that the condemned have his crime written on a placard and carried around his neck to the place of execution. Such was the case with the Lord. Read with me John chapter 19, verse number 19. It says, Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Once the condemned reached the place of execution, the placard was placed upon the cross so that all would know the crime of the condemned man that day. Let's look closely at a, for a moment at the placard and consider the charge. Look again at verse number 19. The writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate wrote the name of Jesus the same name by which he was identified and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the same and only name given among men whereby we must be saved. Interestingly, he also wrote the place of Jesus' upbringing, which is Nazareth. Tiny, obscured Nazareth would be tiny and obscured no longer. Finally, Pilate wrote the crime that was brought against Jesus, the same crime that, ironically enough, he had found Jesus innocent of five times. That is the king of the Jews. A, a, a crown of thorns replaced a crown of gems. A Roman spike replaced a Roman staff, or I'm sorry, a royal staff. And a rugged cross replaced a regal throne. Here hung the king of all creation. Not everyone was accepting or happy of what the placard said, though. If we notice in verse number 20, we read... Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. For the Romans, crucifixions were political events. These were political prisoners who had committed political crimes, and so therefore they wanted the execution to be public and political executions. They wanted everyone to see the condemned man hanging on a cross, to read of their crime, and to be warned. Verse 20 further reads, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. In order to be as public as possible, Pilate had the statement regarding Jesus' crime written in three separate languages, in Hebrew for the Jews, in Greek for the Grecians, and in Latin for the Romans. However, the religious leaders objected to Pilate's writing. Notice verse number 21. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not, notice what they say, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather he said, I am the king of the Jews. They felt it was a false because they did not believe that Jesus was indeed the king of the Jews. They had rejected him as such. He had re they had rejected him as their king. And now Pilate was publicly and politically proclaiming and referring to him as being their king. But yet here, finally, Pilate finds courage to stand against the, group, the Jewish leaders. Notice what Pilate says in verse number 22. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. I have written what I said I was going to write. 
It cannot be changed. In fact, as Adam Clark writes in his commentary, the Roman laws forbade the sentences to be altered once they were pronounced. And as this inscription was considered as the sentence pronounced against our Lord, therefore it could not be changed. The Jewish leaders didn't like it. The king of the Jews, he's not our king. And Pilate simply states, what I have written, I have written, it cannot be changed. Thirdly, this morning we see that Jesus' crucifixion is prophetic. It is prophetic. John's gospel concerning the Lord's crucifixion records several instances of fulfilled prophecy. We will look at two here this morning. Several are listed. In fact, we've already read through a couple of them. But we will look closely here at just two more. First of all, fulfilled prophecy concerning his coat. Concerning his coat, look at what verses 23 through 24 say. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. A Roman crucifixion was supervised by Roman soldiers, both to keep order and then also to make sure that the condemned actually died on the cross. While on the cross, the soldiers took every last possession of the condemned man, including his clothing. Even the clothes on his back were taken, and his tunic was awarded by casting lots for them. They gambled for his tunic. We see the depths of humiliation that Jesus endured in order to accomplish our salvation. He let go of everything, becoming completely poor for us that we could become completely rich in him. He gave up his very clothing so that he might give us his robes of righteousness. John chapter 19, verse 24, we read, They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Understand that phrase, therefore the soldiers did these things. They didn't do them so that they could fulfill prophecy. That's not why they did them. They didn't sit there that day and say, let us cast lots that we can fulfill what David wrote in Psalm 22. But yet we, re, we are reminded, as, as Wayne read this morning, that this was indeed a fulfillment of, of Psalm, I think I said Romans, of Psalm 22, verse number 18. We see also here not only fulfilled prophecy concerning his cloak or his robe, but also fulfilled prophecy concerning his bones. Read with me verses 35 through 37. And he who, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. John gave, validate, John gave validation that he was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. He saw these things with his own eyes. He then explained the reason for his testimony that we may believe, he says. John says, I was there. I can validate these things. I saw these things as a fulfillment of prophecy that we may know, that we may understand, and that we may believe that he is indeed the Son of God. He is indeed our Messiah. In particular, he refers to the sight of the blood and the water mentioned in the previous verses. Now, the source of the water mingled with the blood has been a topic that has been debated by theologians and doctors alike. What is not debatable is the prophetic nature of the water and the blood mixed. Psalm 22, verses 14, which we read this morning, says this, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. Augustus Toplady reminds us of the scene as he writes in his, in, his, in his hymn, Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in, in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure saved me from its guilt and power. 
Nevertheless, John reminds us that the manner and the certainty of his death, the death of Jesus, is an essential part of our Christian belief. He says, so that you may believe. Remarkably, what seemed to be a random choice by an anonymous Roman soldier to pierce the side of Jesus instead of breaking his legs was that these things were done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Jesus' crucifixion was prophetic. We see fourthly today, as we look at verses 25, 26, and 27, Jesus' crucifixion is personal. It is personal. It is difficult to comprehend the agony of a parent watching a child be abused. I, I can't even begin to imagine how Mary must have felt that day. Mary was witness to the pain, to the humiliation, to the shame, to the suffering, to the death of her son. Look at verse number 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Mary experienced this rejection throughout the ministry of Jesus. When he, when he was rejected, she felt the sting. Of all those who looked upon Jesus at the cross that day, none suffered as Mary suffered, as a mother, as a parent. With Mary were his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. These faithful women were there with Jesus through his agony on the cross to honor him and to support his mother, Mary. They were not intimidated by the gruesome scene of the cross, nor the fear of the enemies of Jesus that stood only feet away, mocking Jesus. With great courage, they personally ministered to the Lord as best as they could. Finally, the only other friend of Jesus at the cross was the disciple whom he loved, standing by, as we read verse number 26. John writes that he was at Jesus' crucifixion and saw these things with his own eyes, as we see in verse number 35. And even in the midst of this most painful moment of his life, Jesus cares for the needs of others. Notice what he says. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Jesus consciously cares for his mother to the end, showing that even on the cross, his attention was directed towards others and not himself. To John, he said, Behold, your mother. Mary had other children, and there are references both to the half-brothers and half-sisters of Jesus. Despite this, Jesus left the care of his mother, Mary, to John, the disciple and the apostle. Christ's crucifixion was personal, but only for a few. What about you? Certainly none of us can go back to that day when the Lord was crucified on the cross of Jesus Christ, or was crucified on the cross. So the question is highly suppositional for us. Yet, would you have been there? Would you have been at the foot of the cross? How would you have answered the questions of the hymn writer? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in the side? If we compare our commitment to Christ now to what it would, it would have cost to be at the cross on that day, would you have been present? Many have a hard time being in church regularly or sharing the gospel with people that we know that need to hear. Let us not pretend that we would have found the courage to be personally with Jesus at his darkest hour when we struggle to be with Jesus in our lightest day. Lastly, we see Jesus' crucifixion is a proclamation. Look at verses 28, 29, and 30. It is a proclamation. Jesus knew that his great work on the cross were fulfilled. Observe verse number 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, said, I thirst. Having finished the work that he came to do, he then made preparation to yield his life. And John records two final statements from the Lord. Now, there were other statements on the cross. We can read these in the other Gospels. John just records two. The first that John records is, I thirst. 
Jesus did not accept a pain-numbing drink at the beginning of his suffering, as we read in Mark chapter 15, verse 23. He rejected it. But now he accepted a sip of wine, and I speculate, to wet his parched lips and to dry his throat so that he can make one final announcement to the world. The final statement is this. It is finished. It is finished. The final statement. The Greek word is tetelestai and was used in the first and second centuries in the sense of paying off a debt. Paid in full might be how it would read on the receipt. Here it is, the cry of a winner. It represents the finished work of Christ and is the foundation of all that we trust in and all that we hope for. As Spurgeon states, it was a conqueror's cry. It was, not, uh, it was uttered with a loud voice. There is nothing of anguish about it. There is no wailing in it. It is the cry of one who has completed a tremendous labor. That's what Spurgeon says. One may ask, what is finished? If his cry is, it is finished, then what is finished? All the types and all the promises and all the prophecies pointing to the Messiah to come were now finished. The sacrifices and the ceremonies of the priesthood in the temple were finished. No more were there need to be shed innocent blood. His perfect obedience to his father was finished and complete. All the suffering and all the humiliation that he endured on our behalf were finished. The satisfaction of God's justice has been complete. It was finished. The power and the penalty of sin over all of creation was finished. All that was quiet required for man's redemption was finished. Finally, death was finished. It is finished. Finally, we see that John records uh, that John records that he, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. We see in verse number thirty. Notice here, before we close, very quickly, that as he gave up his spirit, he gave it up willingly. It was not taken from him. It was a voluntary act. No one took it from him. One commentator says that this speaks of a peaceful act, like lying down on a pillow to sleep. Jesus did not hang his head in defeat. He bowed his head in peace. It is finished. As we conclude this morning, Jesus cried, it is finished. And immediately the means by which mankind can be redeemed and stand as righteous before a, before a righteous God has been completed. He faced God's wrath in my place and in your place that I might face God's grace in his. Salvation for mankind is offered full and free. But what about you? You see, he hung in place of all the world. His death was a propitiation for all of mankind that has ever lived or that ever will live. But not all of mankind that has ever lived is going to be in heaven someday. He cried, it is finished. In other words, all that is necessary for your salvation has been complete. But for you, is it truly finished? As you sit here today, is there that spiritual struggle within you as a condemned man, as a, as a wicked man or woman, as a sinner before a righteous God who someday is going to stand before that righteous God and stand condemned because although Jesus Christ has paid your price on Calvary, you must accept it. You must receive it as a free gift. It has been offered. And when Jesus died and shed his blood that day, he uttered the phrase, it is finished because now salvation is freely available for all mankind. But what about you today? Have you experienced the freedom and the salvation that comes through the, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Can you truly say it is finished? Believer, just as Jesus endured your punishment to the very end and then cried, it is finished, what are you enduring for him? What do you seek to do for him? 
You see, because we have been granted eternal life, our life belongs to Him. And He has a purpose for each one of us. It is not to live for ourselves. It is not to bring glory to ourselves. It is not to live that we can be pleased and honored and glorified. My life belongs to Him. Therefore, my labor belongs to Him. So what do I do? What am I doing? And what am I enduring on His behalf? When you stand before him someday, can you say, Lord, it is finished. All that you have given to me to accomplish is complete. Or do you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ ashamed? Because he gave us so much. And with all that he has given us, we have squandered. I'm so thankful that he did not come off that cross. We sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't need 10,000 angels. He could have taken himself off that cross if he wanted to. But he hung there and he died in my place and he said, it is finished. What right do I have to take my life and to use it to bring honor and glory to myself? What right do I have to do anything else with my life than, than to spend it for him that I can say someday, Lord, it is it is finished. So believer, what do you endure for him today? Will we look up at and, and imagine and study and see Jesus on that cross in my place and in your place. How do we wake up Monday morning and go about living our life, my life, and your life the way that we want to live it. He said, it is finished for me. I can do no less, you can do no less, than to take the life that he has given to us and say, Lord, it is yours. May I use it so that someday I can say, it is finished for you. Dear Lord, thank you once again. for looking down on us with pity when you could have just judged us all and that could have been the end of it. But you so loved us. You so loved us that you gave your only son who hung on that cross in our place and stayed to the very end to cry, it is finished. So that we can have the hope of eternal life. There may be someone, as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, there may be someone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know him as a historical person. You celebrate his birth at Christmas time, and you might show up at church on Easter to celebrate his resurrection from the grave. You know there's a head knowledge there. But there's not a relationship. And although Jesus cried, it is finished, and your salvation has been made complete, you have to accept it. You have to receive it. There comes a point in time in your life where you must recognize that you are a sinner. You cannot save yourself. And the only hope that you have is to fall on your face before a righteous Savior and say, please forgive me. I accept your sacrifice on Calvary. And until the moment that you do that, you stand condemned before a righteous God. And that con condemnation is real. And the judgment that is to follow is real. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior today? If you don't, I would love to take a few moments at the end of the service and show you from God's Word how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Not just as a person who hung on a cross. Many people died on a cross. But as the one who died on the cross in your place. As your Savior. How about you today, believer? Believer? He hung there in your place until it was finished. 
Let me ask, what are you doing for your Savior? Do you seek to finish the task that he has given to you? If you were to stand before him right now, could you say, Lord, to the best of my ability, it is finished. I sought to live my life to bring honor and glory to you. Or would you stand there ashamed? I'm going to ask the piano player to play just a verse or two of an invitation song this morning. Believer, if you were to stand before the Lord, would you be able to say, Lord, it's finished. I did the best for you. If not, now may be a good time there in the pew to take a moment. Remember once again what Jesus Christ has done for you and say, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me for my arrogance and for my pride and for my selfishness. Lord, may I use the rest of my life to bring honor to you as well. I'm going to have the piano player just to play a verse or two of an invitation song this morning. Stephen to come and we'll sing one more song as we are dismissed this morning. In your songbook, it'll be song 629, Oh How He Loves You and Me. Go ahead and stand with me as we are dismissed. Thank you for being with us today and I uh, hope that uh, you can go out today knowing that you've been drawn closer to the Lord through what we have studied today and through His sacrifice on Calvary than when we came in this morning. So we're going to sing one more song, Oh How He Loves You and Me. Thank you.